Welcome to the Hollywood Outsider, an award-winning weekly entertainment podcast. In this episode, we're going to discuss Dune Part 2 and all the chatter that comes with it, as well as several other things. Plus, our topic this week is kind of the flip side of last week. What happens when you love a movie and no one else seems to? Let's get down with the show. My name is Aaron Peterson. Joining me today, my fellow host, John Davenport. Hey, buddy. Uh, Man of Sync, out. Troy Heinrichs, out. We're joined by an old standby, one a whole classic, if you will, uh, Scott Clark. What's up? Well, hey, how's it going, man? You're um uh, from the Gaming Outsider, I should say. By God, if I don't mention your podcast, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to be... Make you sad. I, I like to think that the reason Troy's not here is because he's busy playing a specific video game on that released on PS5 That's this what past ha- week. He's, he That's keeps sending exactly me voice messages. Hey, hey, I'm really having a hard time talking. Yeah, because you're screaming at your goddamn console. That's what it <laughs> mm-hmm. is. That's exactly what it Which is. Which game is it? Fantasy, Final Fantasy? Is that what it is? Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Uh, he's probably got 50 hours in that freaking thing. That's why he... he <laughs> I mean, Amanda, well, we're used I, to it, <laughs> but, but Troy, <laughs> Troy's yeah. well, well, over Aaron liable. asked me if I could come on here and do this episode, and I was also playing Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and, uh, you know, you're he's like, I know you got this new game you're playing, but, uh, we, you know, if you want to come on the show, and I figured John was going to be here, and I was like, yep. if John's going to be here, I got to be there. Any opportunity I can get to talk to uh, this guy, because I don't get to see him quite so often, so I had to oh. be here. We yeah, should uh, no, I really appreciate it. And I feel whole finally. Um it's been a long time that this 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 trio uh the has been here. So I feel really good about it and I yeah. feel whole. You feel whole. I feel like fuck off. He just went up through a whole diatribe about how well, John's gonna be there. Yeah, I'm gonna be there. He didn't say a damn thing about my name. <laughs> well, I see you every other weekend. <laughs> <laughs> you complete me, John. Uh, you complete me, buddy. <laughs> you both make me sick. What what's going on with you? What's new? You got any new gaming conventions or, uh, and how is Final <laughs> Fantasy? What game is this one? Which one is it a remake again? Uh, it's a remake of the original Final Fantasy, but they actually took the original game and split it up into three individual games. Uh, and this is the second in the trilogy. So, uh, yeah, it's a big deal in my world. And it's awesome. It's how, how long is awesome. this game? Uh, they're saying 60 to 70, but uh, for me, that probably means. 90 to 100. <laughs> because, yeah, gamer uh, hours, right? It's all gamer yeah, time. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I always call it. How long is this game? 10 hours. Bullshit. 20 hours later. Well, there's 14 chapters. I'm in chapter 5, and I'm at uh, hour 20. So, you know, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. John, you, you, you'd be interested in this. I, everybody that's not a gamer, you're going to be bored and senseless, but... I was asking Scott, how do I drop the difficulty? Because I was playing Prince of Persia Lost. It was at the Lost Crown, and it was kicking my ass. And I'm like, I'm about ready to quit. I'm about ready to quit. He's like, you can drop the difficulty. I'm like, where? Send me a link. Where? <laughs> I was ready That's to quit. Well, it's a good actually, thing, too, because that game is awesome. It is my game of the year as of right now. Yeah, I know it's, it's awesome. only it March, is. but it's fantastic. I've actually made it a point to swear off video games for the foreseeable future at this point. Me, too. <laughs> What? I wish everybody could see the look that John is giving me right now. <laughs> why, why did you choose to swear them off? What they what they do to you? Or touch? Show me on the show me on the Xbox box where it touched you. And they didn't do anything to me in particular, but I, I I've gotten to a point where I I want to be more present in my life and playing video games. I get so sucked into them that I can't be present in my life. So I absolutely want to be able to spend more time with engaged yourself? with more things. Yeah, you know, you know, love me. Be me, you know all those things. Good for you, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, we're both trying not to make fun of you. That's good. Good for you. <laughs> I'm not trying. To I'm not trying to make not fun to make of you. I respect your choices. That's what I'm thinking. I don't hear that, but I get it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming through. Mm. Uh, Scott, have you been watching any movies or TV shows or anything t- new? Yeah, actually, um, I, I, I guys watched that movie Air Force One Down. 
uh, yeah, that, that we gave uh, away a few weeks ago. Yeah, you right? gave me a, you gave me a copy of it. I had never even heard of this movie, and I was like, I like Air Force One, so I'm going to give this one a shot. Did you and, think it was uh, a sequel? <laughs> no, I didn't think it was a sequel because okay. I mean, the, the, right. the, where's Harrison Ford at? This is bullshit. How do you have a, how do you have a sequel to Air Force One? He's like, still it, president. Just, that's how. Get off my plane again. Um, <laughs> no, this one is is a completely different story. It's it's interesting because it 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 has low budget sensibilities in terms of some of the acting is a little suspect. I will say I think there's like sure. two actors I actually recognized in this film. Uh, one of them is the guy that plays Boris from uh, the movie Snatch, which is a, a I love that movie. So when you say uh, you recognize, you don't mean, hey, you guys would know him on the street. It's more like, I saw him in that one thing. Yeah, I don't even know the actors' names okay. to save my life. Somebody from Orange is the New Black is in this, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> President's uh, Air Force One gets uh, taken over by hijackers and, and uh, this you know rogue uh fbi agent that's her first time in the field you know and is happens to be on the plane on this and and she kind of kicks ass and takes names uh i i the the really good thing about this movie is the action scenes are shot really really well i think this should have been called joan wick really it's it's yeah there's a couple action sequences where i was really impressed i was watching it with my wife and even she was like okay that was pretty cool okay so you you enjoyed it though so you did enjoy it? I did. It's incredibly predictable. Uh, you, you know exactly what's going to happen, where it's going to go, the twists are, and all this kind of stuff. But uh, it was it was it was fun for a one watch. It's nothing that I'm gonna I'm burning to see again. But uh, it was it was enjoyable. I'd well, good. probably say like a solid five uh, if hey. if ten dollars were the full price of admission. Hey, five dollars. Yeah, and and you also um, remember five isn't a bad score. It's like so many people on the internet are telling me. Uh, yeah, yeah ad nauseum that apparently we're so hung up on on you know letter grades from school like anything below a 70 is is a failing grade or a, it depends it's, on which school you weird. went to yeah. 60 yeah. or 70 uh another one i watched i don't know if i haven't heard you guys talk about it but i watched uh, next goal wins on hulu yeah we talked about my, it a while ago but it is it is a good movie yeah it's very good movie. it's yeah, it's pretty cookie cutter in in terms of uh, of what happens, but it's such a charming movie, and they laughed out loud on more than one occasion. I was pleasantly surprised on, on that one. It was really, really funny. It was actually, so, but, um, I think when I described it, I said, you know, it's one of the movies where all the supporting characters are fantastic. Like, they really are. It's really mm -hmm. Michael Fassbender is the only one I think is miscast. You know, He does feel a little out of place, but I still enjoyed his performance. I, yeah, he wasn't I still bad. Just, yeah, he wasn't yeah, bad, yeah. but he just felt out of sorts. I, I couldn't figure out because you know he's he is British, right? He am, am I correct on that? He's a British fella. Yeah, he's English. English fella. I, um, I th or Australian? No, he's, he Australian. no, he's Irish and something else. Okay, Irish and German. We need to get a genealogy test with this guy. You know, <laughs> just make sure we understand. But German Irish. There you go. That makes sense. I mean, his first big role, he was speaking Nazi. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, his his accent kind of fluctuated for me. I couldn't tell which one he was trying to land on, but it wasn't enough to be distracting. It was just a it's a really funny movie, and uh, and then you know it's it's based on a, re a true story. So they do the thing in the credits where you see the actual people that yeah. it was based on, and then it was, it was really cool. That's so, yeah. Well, we're gonna talk about Dune Part Two at the end of this podcast. John and I are gonna do our review of Dune Part Two, and then I'm actually gonna segue to another segment that's already a. Uh, pre-recorded that you guys can hear where I talk with uh, Thomas Bax, his longtime supporter of the show, Patreon supporter as well. And um, he and I talked about the differences between the movie and the book, just to kind of mm. dive into that a little bit. That was an interesting dynamic just to hear kind of like why he, and especially why he loves it because I don't love these movies. I, I liked the new one and that wasn't good enough according to the internet. As John can attest, I've I've had <laughs> shitty comment after shitty comment because I said I didn't like it enough, apparently. But <laughs> it's like my favorite thing whenever you get dragged for saying like it's cool and everyone's like, You didn't like it enough. My total favorite thing. This is like the second or third time this has happened. Yeah, it just <laughs> raked over the coals, Scott. I mean, I like the Amber Heard movie. I got trashed by Johnny Depp people. Now I'm getting trashed by the Dune people. I'm uh -huh. just gonna <laughs> it's like what kind of hot take is that? I'm like, I gave it at six fifty, like out of ten, that's like three star three that's over three stars. What do you want? It's a masterpiece. <laughs> 
it's not. Though. Yeah, I sort not of feel like any John way, shape with that with that movie where everybody keeps telling me I have to go see it, and I'm like, "Well, you're you're telling me I have to see it? Yeah, then I definitely am going to wait." Oh yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 in the same boat as you, Aaron. The first one, I found it intriguing visually, but I don't even remember what happened in that movie, dude. I could yeah. not tell you what was going on, and somebody told me that uh, the second movie. It finally reveals what's actually going on. I'm like, if you're waiting till the second movie in a <laughs> in a duology or whatever you want to call it to give me purpose, I, then why even make the first movie? <laughs> I, I don't okay, agree just, with that statement, but I can see why somebody would think that way. Okay. You know, I, right. I, I don't know. I haven't seen it. but I, It's basically like the two movies are one book. So right. I can see yeah, yeah. how you can see it that way. But yeah, I'll, I'll wait for Achebeo. <laughs> Achebeo. <laughs> It's like Scott Bale, but Max. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Scott Bale, but better yeah. and less racist. <laughs> so it, it's an it's an interesting uh, dynamic, and I don't think it's I don't think it's racist. It's not a racist movie. That's story- le- it's like Scott Bale, but better oh, and less racist. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Thought I was gonna have to defend Dune. I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> Jeez. Now the Scott Bale people are gonna come after you, John. They can't find me. <laughs> I'll give them their address. That's fine with me. Okay. He lives here now. <laughs> Let's uh he lives in Florida? He lives in this town. At one two fifteen Mockingbird Lane? Right next yeah. door to you? Well that's yeah. wild. All right. <laughs> Thomas said hi. Hey, we're gonna move on. Uh I was talking to uh several people over the past week about dubbing in films with, with language other than English, including Thomas Beck, you're gonna hear at the end. He at one point said that I wasn't being authentic if I'm not if I'm not <laughs> watching subtitles. But I've had a lot of people kind of throw a a little bit of uh, negativity in my way because I said I was watching the English dub version of Shogun, right? Because mm-hmm. they have an English dub version on Hulu, and I think it's a, a pretty well done version. And I, subtitles, while I do enjoy subtitles, and I have no problem with them. After a while, you end up just, in my mind, watching the bottom third of the screen as opposed to what's going on because there's so much being said. And I, I kind of want to know what you guys think like do you feel using dubbing rather than subtitles is any less authentic in in terms of the experience because my reply of course was snarky and you know my retort is basically like you realize we're not in feudal japan right like these are actors on sound stages there's nothing less authentic you know there's literally Selma Hayek giving me a a mud bath wouldn't be any less authentic (laughs) than this what do you think scott other than I'm I, not going to get a mud bath from Selma Hayek. <laughs> it doesn't bother me one way or the other. Uh, if I have a, if I have the choice, I usually go with the subtitles because I kind of like to see the the film in the way that the you know the filmmaker originally intended. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, we talk about th- things being art, and uh, you know, we, we talk about censorship. You know, we don't want to take out the curse words and stuff because that's how the artist wanted it. Um, you know, that's a problem, but you know, there's a, there's a good subset of people that have zero problem with, with, with changing the, every line of dialogue into another language, which I understand that's not, that's done so that people that don't speak the language can understand it. Um, but to me, it's the same thing. It, it's, it's part of the art in some respect, but I'm also not going to yuck anybody's yum. If you want to watch it that way, Watch it whatever way you can and enjoy the film. I'm not going to knock you if you watch it with dubs. I'm not going to watch you if you watch it with subtitles. Um, do you? I like. I, I don't really understand this this idea of we're going to take tear somebody down because you know they they watch it in a different way than I do. Yeah, I'm. Hmm, I don't really believe in the idea of ruining the authenticity of it i grew up watching everything dubbed in one language or another uh if it wasn't in english it was in spanish if it wasn't in spanish it was in some other language uh but i only speak english and spanish so it doesn't really help but the the thing for me is that i agree that if you watch something with subtitles on uh you end up paying attention to the lower lower quarter of the screen as opposed to the entire the entire image that you have being laid out in front of you. Mm -hmm. And 
as somebody who is um, uh, who reads really slow because I'm dyslexic, it's hard for me to keep up with everything that's going on. And not only that, but if I want to remember what the what was actually said in the movie, uh, I would much rather read it as opposed. I mean, see it as opposed. I'm sorry. I would much rather hear it as opposed to read it, see it, whatever. I'm not convinced. Because- I'm, I'm sure which take you got now. <laughs> I'm not either, honestly, but <laughs> Sorry. I, I would much rather hear it over anything else just because I would, it gives me the ability of connecting the words to what I'm seeing in front of me as opposed to being, having to read everything. And, you know, if I have to listen to something dubbed, I'll, I'll go with English, but sometimes I would actually switch it over to Spanish because I feel like Spanish dubbing is usually better than the English dubbing for whatever reason. And I know this isn't the, the language we're talking about, but I, I really like listening to a Japanese movie or anime or whatever series in Japanese, just because I think the language sounds so cool and it makes it some of the lines cool. yeah. come yeah. across um, in, in like a different cadence than it does in English. I, I, I don't even know if that's like an accurate way to say it. Cause I don't understand the Japanese language. It's very, very complicated, but uh, it is, I, I just like the way that language sounds. So if I have an option, I'm going to, gonna... like you could say I tooted. And it'd be like, and it just sounds very badass. Like you just commandeered an army or something. I don't know. Tooted. Yeah. Okay. It's a very, very minimalist <laughs> example. I actually have started uh, to watch movies with Spanish subtitles. I actually am trying to learn how to speak Spanish. I'm doing one of those okay. online, um, you know, courses where you have like like daily lessons or whatever. Um, I'm about like three quarters of a year th- straight of doing it every single day. Do you feel like you're going to have uh, a conversation? Because John speaks Spanish. We can test it right now. No, no, I'm not anywhere near. I mean, if unless he, unless we're going to have a conversation about where my uncle's pen is or something <laughs> very specific <laughs> like that. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a crazy learning experience. But one of the things I read to do is to watch a movie or TV show that you're very familiar with that you could like basically quote front to back and watch it with either Spanish subtitles or Spanish dubbing um, so that you kind of learn the language that when you hear it in conversation as opposed to the, the the stupid sentences that they come up with on these on these online app learning things because they're really ridiculous sentences that I would never use. Well, so. Probably just to kind of tailor you to certain key phrases and turns of the phrase, right? And like that's probably, sort of thing yeah. I imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a friend of mine's wife, who's Colombian and did not speak a stitch of English when she first came here, um, she used to watch TV with us, and we'd we'd have to have the subtitles on in English on anything she was we were watching, so that she that was her way of teaching herself how to speak English. Oh, there you go. Yeah. See, TV does good things. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not alone in that. And I really, I'm sorry if I offended anyone who's Japanese and thought that that was a. <laughs> that's the first example that came to my very small mind. <laughs> I tooted. <laughs> Just saying. Now you and both I have Shogun did it. in my mind, so everything sounds like that because I've been watching Shogun, which is phenomenal, by the way. If you haven't been watching it, do you ever do that though when you watch a show like that in another language, and like you start. Like your your inner monologue is almost in like that accent or yes. <laughs> language, which you is know what I mean? why if I'm watching Telemundo, I can't go to work the next day because I will be in <laughs> HR in no time. <laughs> <laughs> That's hello, perfect. Jessica. How are you? <laughs> That's not how they talk. On <laughs> Watch Telemundo, man. My All wife right, is Ecuadorian. I, I have watched a lot of Telemundo. I'm just letting you know that's what it sounds like. There's a lot of novellas that he's been watching, and that's exactly how they talk to each other. <laughs> and I don't mean that disrespectful, because I get captivated. I'm like, what is happening? Who slept with who? What? Well, yeah. <laughs> great stuff. You know, I, on, on the flip side of all that, I, I, my favorite thing to point out about Witcher, the first season of Witcher, I had no idea what was going on in that show. And I know they're speaking English to us the entire time. It wasn't until I turned on subtitles for that show that I was able to figure out what everyone was saying. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. There are show I used to do that with Game of Thrones here and there when you, you yeah. get certain yep. really heavy English dialects or whatever, and they were just too thick and I couldn't understand it. You know, mm-hmm. or I want to be able to see 
how the names were spelled. It helped me remember the names better because there's so many characters in that show. Oh, I never cared about that. I was just yeah, like, I didn't give a shit guy, about that, that lady, that girl. Oh uh, no, I wanted to be able to talk about it. I, I, I'm, I know Brian Williams. I had to speak about it educationally, man. Yeah. <laughs> He's pretty good. He was <laughs> or pretty like. Good I had a similar experience that you're talking about with uh, the. I just mentioned it earlier. The the movie Snatch, where the, the, the oh, accents Pitt? are so thick. Yeah, Brad Pitt. You like dogs? Oh, he dogs! Like, you know, you watch that movie enough, and you, he, Brad Pitt starts making sense, yes. and it frightens me. Yeah. <laughs> you look like a boxer. <laughs> I love that movie so much. That's a great yeah. movie. He's great in that. That's probably one of his best roles, honestly. Mm-hmm. Hey, by the way, you've just learned that I don't like Fight Club. We we talked about Fight Club on here, and <laughs> Scott Clark is the gentleman I was referencing when I when I said, you know, one of my one of my good friends loves that movie. Yeah, I literally texted him while I was listening to the episode, and it's like all these years, and you never told me you didn't like Fight Club. <laughs> that was like my all time favorite movie for years. Yeah, well, and I don't. Years. Know, that's why I'm not gonna sit there and because if somebody keeps telling me, well, I really don't like Rear Window because of this, this, and I'd be like, I don't give a shit. You know, it's at some point. Disturbia was better. Oh, uh, piss off. <laughs> wow. That's just not even cool. Shots fired, but I agree with you. Freaking that. One, just to piss him off. What was that Jean Claude Van Damme movie with the same goddamn plot as Fight Club? Uh, there wasn't one. I just, <laughs> I just wanted the you guys to think fight. for a second. <laughs> like, really? Van Damme made the same plot as Fight Club? No. It wasn't. I, I was going to say uh, Jean Claude Van Johnson. Double team, or maybe there was one where he played um, twins. Double team is that the one with that Dennis was Dennis Rodman? Rodman but there was, was one where he one. played twins. Ah, God, now I'm gonna have to watch it this weekend <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> I'm gonna have to watch it this weekend. Is <laughs> absolutely nothing that anyone has said about Jean Claude Van Damme movies since the '90s. <laughs> Double impact. That's what. The, that's, that's what that was. That's the one. Right. That's classic. Absolute gem of a film. <laughs> Almost as good as Air Force One down. <laughs> I really think you should watch that movie, man. I will. I, just, I, really... I, will, I, will, I will watch it. Uh, we should also talk, NCIS is expanding their universe with an origin story for Jethro Gibbs. I assume he started back in summer school. And they're bringing back uh, fan favorites, Tony and Ziva. They're getting their own spinoff of Paramount+. Plus. Look, I, I know none of us probably watch NCIS. Okay, I'm glad I'm not the only one because yeah. I saw this and I'm like, I yeah. have nothing to contribute to this I have nothing to, to contribute. I've seen one episode. I I really couldn't tell you much more about that show. I just, it, it's just more proof that they are just, they are tripling down on content and universes. Like that is what we're getting with, with corporations these days. That seems to be what they want. I can't wait for I doing the Jet TV Thru. show. I saw Jethro Gibbs, and I thought Jethro Tull and the Bee Gees were making a, a collaboration. Oh, so it sounds better. <laughs> it does. It sounds quite a bit more interesting. It does. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people that show's been on for years, though. So we're wrong because people no, love yeah, that the, show. People love it. People do. People do love that show. I don't know how that show's been been around for years, and yet I think Blue Bloods is coming to an end. It's on the same network. For God's sakes, the the you know I was reading some of the articles about this, and I. I would have to admit that I, there, I have probably watched maybe 15 episodes throughout whatever seasons of this show. Or I might have put it on to have some noise on that I don't give a shit about anything else because I'm cleaning the house or some shit. But the idea of a Jethro origin story that takes place in the 90s, I was like, huh, I could I can get behind that a little bit, you know, because the they, NCIS they, origins, that's actually what they're going to call it. Yeah, I can get behind that. Tony and Ziva, I I I would probably watch it for for uh Cody, um, but not for numb nuts. I don't give a shit about him. <laughs> I like them together. I, I I saw them in like a couple clips. They seem like they're fun together, sure, I guess. Uh I don't particularly care one way or the other. I just wanted to talk about the universe and the fact that they're expanding it, so the Walking Dead keeps expanding, NCIS keeps expanding, Law and Order keeps expanding, like content, content, content. Yellowstone keeps expanding. So, I mean, this is the way of the future, I guess. Everybody wants to I mean, universe. that's everything, right? I mean, look at what's been going on with superhero movies. We're getting, like, you have to, like, keep up with every TV show, every movie, every series, like, everything. Yeah, I pass, pass. I'm not, yeah. not doing it. Pass. Yeah. <laughs> pass, pass pass speaking of let's pass on to the next topic but first our show is independently funded therefore 
All the expenses are from our own pockets, and Patreon helps fans support their favorite podcasts. Uh, once you do, you you sign up, you get immediate access to any content in your respective tier. Uh, we just had a bonus episode, and Amanda and I are going to South by Southwest later this week, actually. So there's going to be some bonus content. There might be some some behind the scenes panels and stuff like that that we share on Patreon only. Now that you understand uh, what that is, if you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash the Hollywood Outsider. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash the Hollywood Outsider. And now let's go to our From the Outside In topic. So last week we discussed what happens when everyone seems to love a movie but you. This time we're flipping it and we're going to look at the positive side of that equation. So what do you do when you love a movie that no one else seems to like? And this is very important. I don't mean guilty pleasures or movies that you know aren't great but you still enjoy. Like I was trying to see how can I sell the adventures of Ford Fairlane in this topic and I realized <laughs> I can't. <laughs> It legitimately is not a good movie. I just really enjoy it. So, I mean, you have to feel like the movie is great for whatever your reasons, and you just don't understand how other people don't see it. So does it bother you when you feel like you're on this lonely island and no one understands you? I have gotten so used to it over the years that <laughs> it doesn't really bother me. I, I, I realize that there's just something about my taste or the way I see things that is not as pot, not as popular as what everybody else seems to see things or enjoy. There was a period in my life where I, I just like, loved everything, single movie that I saw and watched and I wanted to own it. I want to have them. I want to be able to watch them whenever I wanted to. And I've gotten quite a bit more discerning since, especially since I started doing this show, because I don't love as much as, as much as I used to, but yeah, it feels weird. It feels like, uh, it feels like I am a little lonely and I always want to sit there and show somebody one of these movies that I love so much and, and see how they take it. And I'm usually still wrong. Wait, are you trying to say that we suck the love out of you? Is that, like Scott, you heard that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would never say Scott sucked the love out of me. No, I'm saying you. The show sucked the love out of you. You said I don't love as much as I used to. What is? <laughs> How is that our fault? <laughs> love better, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus, Scott, I love you, man. I love you too, man. Man, I wish we had glasses to clink right now. Totally yeah, yeah, no, it'd be it'd just to pointy. drive him nuts. <laughs> Scott, what about, what about you? Do you get lonely when? Well, I know you do. I know how you feel about this. <laughs> yeah, I I really don't like it when when people don't agree. Uh, you know, you, if you remember, I, I you know, confrontation and discourse is you know may make for interesting conversation points on a podcast, but uh, it it always gets under my skin and it makes me feel weird. Um, but I just kind of always. I always chalk it up that that it, it, whether it be the way you guys did it last week or, or this week's topic, I just always kind of assume there's something wrong with me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, I, I'm just me a too. wackadoo that 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 likes things <laughs> or don't like other things. Um, there, there must be something wrong with me to keep me from from enjoying something, or there must be something wrong with me that makes me enjoy this thing that everybody else hates, and I've just accepted it. Uh, I've dealt with that my whole life, so yeah. But it does bother me. Yeah, I uh, I'm gonna get you the number to my therapist, man. No, your therapist yeah. is terrible. So what what well, if, what do you mean, by, <laughs> um, <laughs> Scott? So what do you what do you mean you've been doing it like your your whole life and you finally accepted it? Not you have you accepted that maybe just you know you just have a difference of taste. It's not really a well, it's it's a difference of of taste. But like you know, even growing up when I love things that everybody else didn't. It was, um, I wanted people to enjoy the things that I did because I wanted them to enjoy it with me. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I feel like somebody doesn't like a film that I absolutely adore or I just really find hilarious or moving or whatever, I, I, I want someone else to have the same experience I do. Um, and in a lot of cases, that's just not possible because they, they either are shut off from it or it just didn't click with them the same way it did for me. I my favorite thing is to have a shared experience with a film. Um, you, you know, this from like, I love going to see comedies with both of you guys Yeah, yeah. because when we're all laughing together, we're all enjoying something like that. It is like one of the best feelings in the world. Yep. And Agreed. even outside of comedies, it's the same way with action movies or drama movies. I want someone else to share in that reason that we like something that we do. And when somebody doesn't, 
and I can't convince them to either give it another shot or see it from another perspective, it bums me out because I, I, I want that for them, if that makes sense. I find, well, I, it helps that my I don't give up meter is pretty high, but I, I don't get bothered by it. I just say, well, I guess we just have different tastes and whatnot. I, I don't like when people barrage me, though. Like, that really pisses me off. Like, if, if you, I didn't like it. Okay. Well, man, that's awesome. Okay. Well, I didn't like it. Well, you're just trying to be, what well, they said in the Dune thing. You're trying to be cool. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. That's my dream. It's you know. not like you said Jonah Hex was awesome. <laughs> it's, people are weird, man. I swear to God. <laughs> couldn't love it enough. It's just it's weird. <laughs> Wait, it's not awesome? <laughs> Go look on the Facebook, uh, our Facebook page and find that my, my very short Dune, I didn't even write a full review. I just wrote like a, a couple, a quick synopsis. Man, they just bam, bam, bam. Anyway. You know, I, I try not to, it's when people keep coming back and I like just won't let it go. That's when it just irritates the crap out of me. That's the only time it really bothers me. It's just like, let it go. We didn't agree. We didn't see the same thing the same way. It happens. Not a big deal, but we didn't agree. And I, I think more people should just move on from that. And st- instead of trying to hammer home the idea that you need to like the thing that I like at all times. Right. I've gotten better at it. Like, it, like in the early days of social media, I was a lot more liberal about voicing how I felt about things and on Facebook and Twitter and things like that. And I've realized that over the years, it's just not worth the fight or the argument anymore. Like, okay, all right. But I also don't like leave it in a way like that pisses off the other person. I just kind of ignore the thread at that point. You don't want to antagonize? I don't want to antagonize and I just, it's just a losing battle. You're not going to convince somebody and it's not worth the energy. I've got way more things to do besides argue with a stranger on the internet. Right. The amount of energy I have for that sort of stuff. And then, uh, and you know, life that I want to live is so much more than fighting with somebody that I don't even know. Right. I mean, think of all those video games you have to ignore. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I, I, the only time I really get irritated is if I'm trying to show someone something or watch it with them, and they say they want to watch it with me. I, I never jam a down base throat. Hey, if you don't care, you don't care. I'm there's too much stuff to watch. I get it. But if you're like, oh yeah, let's I want to watch that movie, and then they're just playing with their phone the whole time. I just can't do it. I just I'm like, all right, I'm out. Peace out. <laughs> I have no no interest in watching this with you anymore. You obviously yeah, don't it care. It doesn't matter if I'm at the theater or if we're in person. I have to have my phone off when I'm when I'm hanging out with Aaron. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's my thing. I, I, you're not watching it. You're not paying attention. Yeah. You know, I also insist on it on the podcast and, and you probably noticed that, uh, man and John don't, don't always comply. You know what I'm saying? I d- did not notice. So uh-huh. Quality editing. Editing is great. Let me tell you. Editing is <laughs> smooth. Uh, all right. Well, let's, let's talk about some, some picks. Let's go around Robin and just a few movies that this occurred. And, and one, I'll use an example of, is I'm a big fan of A Million Ways to Die in the West. It got 33% of Rotten Tomatoes. It was not well received. And if you ask most people that have seen it, they'll say it wasn't funny. I laughed my ass off in that movie. I yeah, I, I agree. I think that movie was hysterical. Well, I'm, The Mila Kunis joke alone was worth it. There's so many jokes that are just, I th- yeah, it's too long, but Shelley's Theron is, is great. I think Seth MacFarlane is really, really funny. I just love that movie, but it was not well received and audiences didn't really like it so it always gets me you know hey what's a great comedy and i'll recommend it and then wait no no i heard that was terrible but i love how aaron gives an example as a way to get his yeah, honorable mention yeah, that's, how I get in right one in. that's what happens when you write the format brother <laughs> <laughs> you can do whatever you want it's like being willy wonka uh, which yeah. is a better movie than dune so moving into uh actual picks i'll start with the chronicles of riddick 29% of Rotten Tomatoes. It was kind of trash when it came out. This is, you know, it was kind of like the, a reboot of Riddick. It was Riddick, but not, even though it's technically a sequel, it's really not. I mean, it's really launching its own thing. There's a lot of world building here. Uh, the Necromongers and, and all of that depth and... and <laughs> it's a space opera. Yeah, it's like, yeah, space opera. And I just, I love the way it was done. You got Judy Dench in a Vin Diesel movie. Like, what the fuck is happening? <laughs> and then it just, Carl Urban was great. It was just a combination of factors that I love that movie. I absolutely adore that movie. And that no, there were a few fans that would come on board and say, oh yeah, I had fun with it and da, da, da. I'm like, no, I think that's a great movie. 
honestly, I think it's, in my opinion, the best movie Vin Diesel's done. And I mean that. Wow. Uh, not, we're not, as a lead, Saving Private Ryan fans, calm down. So he, <laughs> it, it's just a great, I think it's a great movie. I think it's a great story. It's a great world builder. Like, I really wanted to see more in that universe and where it was going and kind of what it all meant. And we never really got that. We got a, you know, quasi, we got another pitch black is what we got with the third movie. So we never got the promise that came from this first one, but I absolutely love that movie. I need to go see it. <laughs> I, I, I watched the first one, Pitch Pitch Black. Yeah. Is that what it was called? Yeah. I black. love Pitch Black. I think you introduced that to me <laughs> back in the day, but uh, I stayed away from the sequel because of the negative reviews. So yeah. obviously that was, a, that was a thing. John, you saw it, right? It's been a while since I've sat down and watched it, but I do I do recall that I enjoy it. I enjoyed it the first time I saw it. I enjoyed the there was a cartoon that came out around the same time that followed followed Riddick as well that was called um, Dark Fury or something like that that was more about Riddick and, and like a, it was an in between Pitch Black and mm-hmm. the Chronicles of Riddick and that was very cool and I liked the world building that they had going on so I was excited to see where they were going to go with it. And though I find things that are enjoyable about the third movie, I, I'm a little disappointed that all it is is just a rehash of the first movie again. It's a uh, you know as if we didn't learn our lesson um, uh, with doing things like this at all. But it's it is a great movie, and I'm I am I'm with you on that. All right, John, what do you got? So my very first pick I'm going to go with is a is a little known movie uh, that not a lot of people love, and I don't know why, but it's Hudson Hawk. It's sitting at a 31. percent It stars our sweet good friend um, Bruce Willis and Danny Aiello, and it is one of the more charming movies that you'll ever sit down and watch. And I joke about it, but it's it's a movie that I've loved ever since the first time I saw it. I love the mechanics of how they how they rob things and the way they keep time by singing songs to each you know throughout the whole process. I think that that's fantastic. It's got a great beat to it as far as rhythm uh, rhythm of story and how how they're moving from one set piece to another set piece and everything about it is just well done. And it's something that looks like people are having fun making. And I don't understand how nobody likes this movie. Well, I, I it's love become this movie. a Bunny. I Bumble. love this movie. Yeah, it's become a cult classic over the years, but when it initially came out, this movie was wildly trashed. Uh, it was. I saw it in the theater six times, I think. Uh, I loved it. Wow. So most of the box office was me. <laughs> so I'm with six you, tickets was most of the too. box office? I didn't do well. Yeah, it didn't do well, my friend. <laughs> good good choice. That That's good. I think more people love that movie than you realize, though. No, it's, it's, it's a cult. like I said, it's a, it's a cult classic. It is. It, it has become a cult classic for sure. But when it first came out, it did not do well. And I was, I was, I was poked at for loving this movie so much. Scott, what about you? I know you had less time to prepare. It, it actually wasn't that difficult to come up with one. I could have come up with a, a bigger list. But uh, um, and my first one, I have four just in case this one doesn't count because it did get 55 on Rotten Tomatoes. Is that too... Hi. No, I think no for nope, this. No, nope. that's, uh, that's not a positive. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make sure because it was rotten or whatever the you know the yeah. little green symbol. But uh, I, I feel like a lot more people like this than fifty five percent of it. But the cable guy, I feel like it is the redheaded hmm. stepchild of Jim Carrey movies. Like most people are like. Don't even think of the cable guy when they think of Jim Carrey movies. And it's one of my favorites of his because he did something completely. Yes, he was he was out there in wackadoo, but he did something a little bit different with comedy. And I've always appreciated that movie. And there are things in that movie that make me laugh out loud every single time I've seen it. And but it's a weird movie. It's a genuinely weird, uncomfortable movie. And I, I feel like nobody ever talks about it anymore except for like. Cable, they'll just say cable guy and that that's it. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. I don't but I don't think I love that one, but I don't think it's bad either. I think it was an interesting movie. At least they were trying something different, for sure. Oh, it just seriously cracked me up. There's so many <laughs> so many quotable scenes in that movie that just seriously cracked me up. That was like the height of his career too. Like he was just on fire. And I think that's possibly why it didn't do as well, because everyone was expecting Wild and zany, but not in an uncomfortable because that was like a dark movie. It was a dark comedy. Yeah, it was pretty dark. In, in every way. 
But uh, I loved it. Absolutely love that movie. It's I, I've probably watched that one more than any other Jim Carrey movie that wasn't Liar Liar. Really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, I really it's love basically that movie. like a comedy stalker movie. It's just like let's make fun of the stalker because Jim Carrey was a stalker and he was was it Ben Stiller? Ben Stiller was a director. Or he's the but, director. Uh, Matthew Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. Broderick. Yeah. Okay. And and, it, <laughs> and Ben Stiller also had the cameo where he was the one of the twin brothers that murdered the other twin brother, and <laughs> yes. there was like this case that was going on in the background, <laughs> and that whole courtroom scene that they're just like watching on TV just made me laugh so hard. I can't. I probably can't even say it on this podcast, but it was really you couldn't get away with that joke today. But no, it was great. you couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, my next one, if you're a long-time listener, you've heard me mention this movie before, but unfortunately, uh, people do not rave about it. It's not spoken of in, in the popular in military. Polite circles? What's that? <laughs> in polite circles? Yeah, in polite circles. It's just not really recognized as, as a great film, as a great war film, which I think it is. And it's Savior, uh, 56% of Rotten Tomatoes. It's, not, it's just seen as mediocre, and it's not. I think it's a great film. It's the best performance Dennis Quaid's ever given. And what it is, is he basically loses his wife uh, in a terrorist attack. So he joins the Foreign Legion as a way to, to get revenge against Muslims. He's just He just becomes full of hate. And he ends up as like an, an anonymous mercenary in Bosnia. And then he comes across this woman who is pregnant, a, a young Serbian woman. And she's about to be killed because of her dishonor. And so he keeps going to save her life. And it's just him rediscovering himself and redemption and just going through the hell that he's been through and, and trying to come out to the light on the other side and be the guy that he used to be. It's, it, I just find it to be a great film. It's probably in my top five military related films, like war films of all time. I just absolutely love it. I would put it up there with a saving private Ryan and a lot of other ones. Like I absolutely love that movie. Nice. Well, you also have a soft spot for, for Dennis Quaid. Oh, I do. Yeah, I do. I told you the story where I went to see the long game with at South by Southwest and a lot of, you know, the actors are there and mm -hmm. I went to the bathroom and then cause Magnum PI was in the movie, um, Hernandez, uh, J. J Hernandez. And Dennis Quaid was also in the movie. I sat literally across the aisle from Dennis Quaid, which was a highlight of my day. And so <laughs> I go to the bathroom and then J Hernandez comes to Magnum PI and I'm like, Hey, you know, I thought you'd be taller and da -da. um, Whoa, and really? You said that? <laughs> Well, I know I said I thought you'd be bigger is what I said because we're in the men's room and were then you, were you, you know the he urinal? left yeah of course I was <laughs> and you said I thought you'd be you're bigger welcome. <laughs> you're welcome yep. total me and so I went back and sat down and then uh 10 seconds later Dennis Quaid went to the bathroom 10 seconds I could have been doing my business right next to one of my favorite actors who knew yeah I mean cool story that's man. not how most people would frame these things but that's you almost did. stood next to Dennis Quaid at a urinal. That's a great story. <laughs> that's the story. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> that's gonna be that's gonna be perfect. Hey, 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 Aaron, why don't you tell that story about how you almost <laughs> stood next to Dennis Quaid at the urinal? <laughs> uh, John, what do you got? All right, so my second choice is another movie that I love so much. I've already mentioned it before in this podcast uh, several different times. It's one of the great movies that M. Night Shyamalan has done. That's Lady in the Water. Mm. Oh. I love this movie. Oh, God. I was, look at that. There's a, look at the look of disappointment I'm getting from Scott right okay. now. You're getting I've it from me, it, too, brother. So I've only seen it once, so I'm going to hear you out, and maybe I'll give it another shot, but man, I, I don't think I got it. So sell me on rewatching this movie. <laughs> I don't think I got it. I don't think I got it. Look, it's just to me, it's a beautiful story about a man who's uh, who's lost his his way as far as being able to love and connect and connect with people, and he's forced into a situation where he is connecting with somebody who is a, a, above everything else, very much ethereal, and he and he is forced to care for somebody that he hasn't had the care for uh, for anybody in a long time, and. It's to me, it's a story about how he had to reopen himself and reconnect to, to himself to become more of who he's supposed to be as opposed to just hiding away as just a simple, uh, maintenance guy for this this apartment complex there's that side of the story that i really love i love the side of the story where it's this 
urban fantasy of anything could happen and anything can like intersect with our world. And even though um, they're weird animal like creatures that are doing whatever it is they're doing, I, I, I just dig the idea of it. So there's all sorts of different aspects that I like to go on these flights of fantasies with that are both simple and easily grounded into what the world our world is today but also can take you on this whole trip of of um adventure is that the one where the guy only exercises one arm yes yeah i found that super disturbing when i saw that in the theater <laughs> yeah i'm not I, I know amanda this is one of her she she hates this movie i think right mm-hmm. yeah i'm i'm on that side of the fence um I tried. I mean, she believes so, in she believes in ghosts, so I mean, you can't really think of anything. She's, that's true. What does she know? What does she? Know? But I, I'm not a fan of this one either. So I, I'm on the side of the people against you on this one. Sorry. That's fine. That's. Fine. I'm not knocking you for liking it, man. I just no, I, no. I'm not like no, not at all. Just did I didn't like it. That's all. You guys don't have to like it. I did. I, I'll give it another shot someday. <laughs> Scott, now we're on to you. Oh, uh, this uh, movie that I'm going to talk about is one of the first ones I thought of, and I went to look up the Rotten Tomatoes score, and I was shocked to see that it was 10%, and I don't get it. And I will say, I will preface this by saying I haven't watched it in years. It's been a long time, but I remember as a kid watching this and and really enjoying it, and I never understood why nobody did. And it's Kevin Costner's The Postman. Do I you like The Postman? Like The Postman? What? It was like a really long movie, even for a kid, right? Isn't it like two hours and 45 it's minutes like or something? It's like 19 hours, I think, if I remember yeah, right. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a miniseries. It's it's six episodes, right? <laughs> it's not that long. I don't think it's that long. I'm just but... telling you what it felt like. <laughs> I just remember Is watching this. Is deliver it... that shit? Jesus. <laughs> well, because th- this one came out after Dances with Wolves, right? Yes. So uh, yeah. I think everyone was expecting that from a from another you know, epic movie. And that's not what it was, but I just found it really interesting. I was like, I was captivated the whole way as a kid. And, but yeah, like when you're a kid, your attention span isn't nearly what it is when you're an adult. And even then, I mean, I had to have been 16, 17 years old when this movie came out, uh, 97, I think it was. And I really enjoyed it. It was, it, so I did not understand the hate. So. This conversation has made me want to go back and rewatch it and see if that still stands. But man, really enjoyed that movie and never understood why it was just universally hated. I think it honestly was hated because it wasn't Dances with Wolves. Like it didn't it didn't reach that same high bar, in my opinion. I'm sure that's part of it. I just I just remember not enjoying it. I didn't enjoy Wyatt Earp either. I I just really wonder if. But I love Open Range and I love Dances with Wolves. So uh, maybe it's a hit or miss kind of thing. I love Waterworld. I love Waterworld too. I saw that movie like seven times. It ruled. Yeah. That was a callback to Cable Guy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys love Waterworld? That's worth talking about. Really? I yeah. almost put that on the list, but I thought, like, I feel like it didn't do well with critics, but I feel like everybody likes that movie. Like, I, no, most people hate that movie. Really? <laughs> what? Yeah. No, I don't think they do. I love Waterworld. It, that is such a fun, fun movie. It's kind of a stupid ending, but uh, Dennis Hopper just being full on Dennis Hopper in that movie was great. Right? He's just like, I just got out of rehab. This is what I'm going to do. It's yeah. great. Now, I, 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 yeah, I, I enjoy Waterworld. Not to like find an uh, interesting way to throw in my honorable mention, but there, there you we go. go. <laughs> and Jack Black was in that movie. Did you know that? Yeah, in Waterworld. Yeah. yeah. He's uh he's like a pilot in like remember when the the scene where I he don't. like shoots the he shoots the plane <laughs> from the trimarine with a harpoon. I promise you, whatever you're going to describe, I don't recall. But John might really. Yeah. I've seen that movie so many times. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's he's like a pilot in the in the plane or or a passenger in the pilot in the plane that's like circling around him. Just like a tiny little shot, you only see him for a second. But yeah, Aaron, what's your next one? So my next one is what I would consider, uh, I would put it as, you know, I've talked about Ridley Scott. I don't think he, you know, he, or I, I don't think he's a bad director. That's not what I mean. He's gotten really deep in this style over substance. Like a lot of his films, I don't think are 
as good as they could be. They always look fantastic, but they just don't work as movies anymore. And he's had a couple that people love, right? Alien, obviously. Gladiator, love that. Uh, but there's one that uh, people kind of trash that I absolutely adore, and I would say is one of my, it's probably my favorite Ridley Scott movie, and that's wow. Black Rain with Michael Douglas. Um, he is he is a cop, Nick Conklin, and his partner is Charlie. He's played by Andy Garcia and just like one of his first roles. He is just a wonderfully fun and energetic character. And they <clears throat> they they catch this basically Yakuza henchman named Sato, and they have to take him back to Japan. But the problem is that Nick has been under investigation for kind of being on the take. So when they get to Japan through a series of circumstances, they end up losing Sato in Japan and he basically can't come back because they think he's been paid off to let him go because they think he's on, he's on the take. So he has to find him. He can't go back until he finds him. And so the whole movie is, you know, fish out of water, et cetera. You know, they're learning Japanese customs and he's trying to investigate a crime in a, in a country that doesn't do it. The old school cop way that he does where he's basically like, you know, breaking rules and, and, you know, just not being the best cop ever. They're very respectful and dutiful and doing everything by the book. And he just doesn't know how to do that. So it's just the, that conflict of worlds coming together and colliding and trying to solve this crime and also kind of diving into the kind of person that Nick Conklin really is. And Michael Douglas, I think is a, is a great actor when he wants to be. It's just, I love the movie. I love the way that they, they interject culture into the film you learn a lot about Japanese customs. It's shot in Japan. I mean, it just looks absolutely stunning. So every every moment, you know Ridley Scott can capture a scene visually, and he does that over and over and over again. The score is fantastic. It's just, I think it's a fantastic film. Like, I absolutely love it. It, it had a 54% of Rotten Tomatoes. I am alone in that belief. I get it. Wow. But I absolutely love that movie. I've seen it probably 30 times. I love it. I read this in the format and thought it was, and in my mind, I had a hard rain <laughs> from like 98 with Morgan well, I Freeman. I do like Christian Slater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do like that's what Christian I thought. Slater. I didn't realize until you started talking about it that I totally had the wrong movie in my head. <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome though? I love Christian Slater wet. <laughs> I have this image of chubby rain. So. <laughs> what is chubby rain? Chubby oh, rain. From Bowfinger? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Chubby Rain was the name of a club here in in our in our town back in the day. You used to have whole rock venues. Yeah, there's a Bowfinger. The fake movie they were making in Bowfinger was called Chubby Rain. I, you know, I think I've seen this movie twice, and I think I've enjoyed it both times I saw saw it. The thing reason why I keep on saying I think is because it's not anything that sticks out of my memory, but it also doesn't stick out of my memory of something that I don't need to give my time to. Hmm. All right, John. What about you? So my final one is going to be one of my favorite movies that I, I'm going to put into like my top 50 movies. And this is a, a movie that I get surprised that by every time somebody tells me they hated it. And that's Sucker Punch. Oh, God. It's, yes. <laughs> you hate I, it. I love this movie so, so much. I. I love the the nuance to the story. I love the imagery of it. I love what Zack Snyder is doing with everything about it. It's just so much fun to watch. And the if you if you pay enough attention to the story, it is a it's a heartbreaking story that will give you some feels if you want to just open yourself up to it. Uh, I've I've watched this with somebody who ended up crying at the end because they they thought what? the. the it was it was such a, a beautiful story, and they were so on the uh, on the side of uh, Sweet Pea. So uh, you know, it's just to me, it's just a great story, and I I love the feel of it. Isn't that the one where Scott Glenn is always like, "Oh, and one more thing." Yes, like <laughs> I, it's a great it's a great movie, and they're pretty girls kicking ass. And it, that's why and you it, guys like it. You're simple no, men. No, that's you're I simple has, simple men. Has, Come on. Has, has, that's not the reason why I like it. That's part of the reason why I like it. <laughs> that's <laughs> not it's not honest. the reason. No, I'm I'm being honest too. It's not the reason why I like it. I I do I appreciate looking at beautiful women. Of course I do. Am I going to sit there and say that that's the reason why I lo love this movie? Well, then if that was the reason why I love this movie, then that volleyball uh, martial arts movie that's based off a of video game would probably be at the top of my list. Uh, Scott, life. help me out here. DOA. DOA. Better, yeah. You know, there's only one DOA, and it's one with Dennis Quaid. 
and that's also right. a great movie. <laughs> right. There's another well, so I, feel, I, I think this the Sucker Punch really feels like a CG video game. <laughs> like it, it, it's, it really does. The whole thing looks like a video game when they're doing the dream sequence thing, as like, opposed it, to a non CG video game. Well, yeah, there's live action, full motion video, video games. Okay. I don't know what's happening. I feel like there's a nerd fight, and I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I, no, but, uh, but, DOA, but, great movie. <laughs> <laughs> with Dennis Quaid. With Dennis, and yes, with you're Dennis right, Quaid. And before you write, yes, I know there was that's a remake of, of an older movie, but I didn't care because this is the only one that matters. Right. <laughs> we just have a whole Dennis Quaid I'm episode. a fan. All right? That's what fandom is. You know, it's kind of like these Dune fans. I'll fight people that say Dennis Quaid is a hack actor. I will. He's a huge fan of movie 42. Easy killer. Easy. <laughs> Easy. I have standards. Uh, Scott, last one. What do you got? Last one. I will not be surprised if neither of you have ever heard of this movie. Um, I, it's difficult for me to put in words why this one has such a soft spot for me. Mm. But uh, have either of you seen the movie Gunshy? With Liam Neeson, yes. Sandra Bullock, Oliver Platt. Yes, that that I remember. That was like fifteen years ago. I want to say it's a it's a older movie. Yeah, but I it's such a ridiculous story. I don't remember um, it. I don't. But remember it cracked it. me up. It's uh, Liam Neeson is an undercover cop, and uh, Sandra Bullock is the <laughs> the nurse that gives him his enema, <laughs> and um, <laughs> she winds up helping him get through because he's like super stressed out about being undercover. He's like always worried about getting killed and everything. And uh, Oliver Platt is like the the mobster guy that he's like undercover trying to bust basically. And hilarity ensues. <laughs> Liam Neeson goes to group therapy and the people in his therapy group wind up getting involved and it's just a super silly movie. But Liam Neeson is like being ser- being Liam Neeson through the whole thing. Um, Sandra Bullock, this was back when Sandra Bullock was, you know, Miss Congeniality days. So she was super cute and spunky. And, um, I just, I, I've been trying to find this one streaming somewhere because I just, I've wanted to rewatch it for a long time and it never pops up because I feel like it's such an obscure movie. That's Have you seen right. it, John? Um, I don't think so. It's 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 hilarious. At one point, Liam Neeson is uh, trying to you know be calm when he goes undercover, and he takes whatever medicine the doctor prescribes him. But it's it's uh, it's it's very a drowsy medication. So he's talking to Oliver Platt, and Oliver Platt like puts a gun in his face right before he passes out from from whatever he had had taken. So the rest of the movie, Oliver Platt thinks that Liam Neeson's character is a total badass because I put a gun in your face and you just fell asleep on me. And it just like that whole concept was was hilarious to me. It's it's ridiculous. The girl that that gave him an enema is now like his best friend. Like who who came up with that? And for me, the whole thing worked. And I I've watched it multiple times back in the uh, late nineties, early two thousands. You can you can still rent it on digitally. You just you just can't stream it for free. It looks like right. Yeah, like what like four bucks to rent it or yeah, thirteen really, to if, buy it or if something. If you're like really that, committed yeah. to your love, <laughs> right? Yeah. <He's, laughs> yeah. Four he loves it. He but he doesn't love it four bucks. Yeah. Four bucks. I mean, you know, we live in a world where people are like, man, I really want to watch that, but I don't want to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's so much other stuff to watch. Yeah. So I, I get it. I, I get yeah. I don't have a problem waiting for it to come to a streaming service somewhere. Hey, Michael but, Weatherly's in this too. You you literally just said you don't like him. I don't. So weird. I almost said, hey, that oh. douchebag Michael Weatherly is in this too. Yeah. Hey, that guy oh, I don't like, he's in this movie too. That was 2000, by the way. That was 24 years ago. My God. My God. And nobody's still heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to segue. Um, we're going to move past that to our Dune 2 review. Uh, Scott, you, you are more than welcome to interject if you'd like. For the spoiler free review, if if you would like to. Uh, for the we spoiler free part, for you because... sure. Okay. All right. Well, the spo- most of the, sp- the spoiler stuff, I'm leaving for the conversation after this point. So it's going to be spoiler free, but we will be talking about the movie and, and what we liked and didn't like and just dancing around it. So Paul Atreides uh, still lives on the outskirts of civilization as he learns what it means to be a Freeman, right? His mother Fremen. is... Con- what? 
Fremen. What's the same difference, dude? You said Freeman. It's Fremen. It's, you don't think that was written to mean Freeman? Like, <sighs> Freeman. That's really what they're going for. And if they're going to be that on the nose, I'm going to be on the nose. Okay. Now, Freeman has a completely different connotation if you study medieval history. Son mm-hmm. of a bitch, teacher. All right, explain, please. <laughs> Well, you've got the hierarchy of uh, you know lords and serfs. Uh-huh. Lords were at the, or you, you get the king at the top. Lords were the nobility, and then you had the freemen and the serfs, which were the lower class. Or basically, a lower class of citizens, the lowest of the low. So the either freemen. way, I'm right. <laughs> Except for the pronunciation. Okay, <laughs> Freeman. Uh, his mother is converting to the Reverend Mother. And her name is Lady Jessica, but she seeks to protect her son and an unborn baby against everything else, even if it means stoking the flames of religious fanaticism, as well as the Freeman <laughs> believe Fremen. Paul to be the Messiah <laughs> promised in prophecy, as we, as you learned in Dune 1. The one that will possibly deliver them all from the tyranny of the emperor's plight to, to steal all their spice. Of course, they still have to contend with the Harkonnen family, who have a new warrior on, on Paul's case, a psychopath named Fade Ratha. Everything's on this collision course. If Paul can stay the path and be the man that Chani, who's played by Zendaya, wants him to be. But is he that man? And that's where I want to start, John, because Timothée Chalamet, it's really pronounced Timothée, but you can call him Timothy Chalamet. He's this guy. He's the Paul Atreides, right, of Dune Part 2. Right. I had problems with him in the first movie. I just felt like mm-hmm. he's not the guy that is going to win me over to being a leader and a badass, and I'm not convinced mm-hmm. he is yet. What say you? Do you do you feel like he captures this role better in this film than he did the first one? No, I've, I'm still stuck in this 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 frame of mind where he is not he's not Paul Atreides or even somebody who would be able to have the stature or the the charisma to be able to lead a bunch of people. I totally buy if Paul Atreides was this child of a, of a, of a prince or, and he, and that was all his character was supposed to be. Uh, But if he was supposed to become somebody who then evolves into this, let's say Messiah, because they say it in the movie as well, um, then you get this, he just doesn't have it. He just doesn't convince me. There's a, there's a lot of different casting issues that I find with this movie and he's, he's the top of the list. Now, what do you say? Because, uh, I've had that, that complaint. I wouldn't call it a complaint. I don't think he's bad, right? It isn't a complaint to say that Timothy Chalamet didn't do well enough in the part. I think he, he makes the movie flow. I get it. He makes the spice flow, but he's just not, he's not taking the movie to the next level. Like you want to use terms like masterpiece and fantastic, then you got to have everything across the board. And that's the lead is where it all starts. And I just right. don't see him as that captivating, charismatic leader. He's not going to sway me to a cult. You know what I mean? He's just not no, going to do no, it. Um, absolutely not. Zendaya as Chani, she probably could. She she does a lot of uh, thinking and and discussion with her eyes and her movements in that respect. There There's a lot of, her beliefs and her non-beliefs that really factor into the story as it rolls forward here. And I really, really appreciated her performance. Did you feel the same about that? I was okay with her performance. I I, I, I thought, you know, yes, she's doing a lot of great acting and she's doing a lot of, but she's still, to me, she feels out of place. She doesn't feel, everybody feels like they're part of this civilization of the Fremen and she found, feels like she's from a different planet entirely from the rest of the Fremen. So that's my one challenge with her is that uh, whereas everyone does seem like they're well and embedded into the culture, she stands out only because she's putting a lot of like almost a little too much of herself into the role. All right. You said you have some some casting issues. Like what what are the casting issues? Timothy, Timothy, whatever you want, however you want to pronounce it. He's my primary. My secondary is Christopher Walken as the emperor. Really? He, yeah. Wow. I did not appreciate him as the emperor. I, I mean, he doesn't do much. He does. No, he doesn't do much. And he's, I, 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 I was uh, expecting him to like be just sitting there looking into, looking at the nothing and have a Werther's original in his mouth and just kind of <laughs> flipping it around in his mouth. Like, like that's, there's, I don't understand why Tim, like why Christopher Walken was the choice for this character. Cause he, again, you're talking about an emperor. He's supposed to be this imposing figure of that leads a, leads an empire of, that spans through the cosmos 
this guy doesn't do that for me in, in this movie. It's wild how we have completely different opinions on this. Because I thought it was... Yeah? Yes. I, I like that he's not over-the-top, ridiculous, you know, overlording figure. He's just a, a man who has done this for a very long time. He's very comfortable in his rule, and he doesn't really feel much excitement or in, enjoyment in it anymore, but he's done it for so long. So he's just going to prep his daughter, who's Florence Pugh, granddaughter, sorry, uh, Florence Pugh, to take over for him one day. And, and I feel like he did the very, he has maybe 10 minutes of screen time. That's it. Right. And I think he I've, does very well with what he has. I Yeah, he uh, maybe, but I feel like he, he feels too frail to me. I, I think he is frail. I think that's why she's getting, you know, queued up to take over because he's frail he knows he's falling she should be the next in, in succession in that respect um speaking of florence Pugh, i thought she's wonderful she doesn't get much to do either she's only in the no, film she doesn't but she's 20 awesome minutes. but uh rebecca ferguson i'm sure you're gonna rave about her because you have a love thing for her so mm-hmm, she's great mm-hmm. i assume mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> okay. yeah i mean she's amazing she's she steals the scenes every single time that she's on it uh austin butler he was so good okay why did you like him so much i'm going to talk about him a little bit more with thomas so i'll i'll save my thoughts for that but why did you think he was so good uh, he, he was clearly somebody who was enjoying the role so clearly somebody who was like oh i am going to like dig into this being a psychopath and live it and love it and do everything about it and it it was just so like as far as like when you look at somebody who's going to supposed, supposed to be a leader of of a force, he played that part so much better. He played he had a gravitas to him. He was he was intense and he was scary and he was just all these different emotions that could, that can equate to I better follow this guy or I'm going to end up dead. I will likely end up dead because I am following this guy, but still. All right. So what did you think overall? You and I were both on the same page that the first one was pretty okay it was just dull um unfortunately i ca- i call it a slog and i mean that it was a slog to get through i did not enjoy watching that film i found this one to be a lot better uh i enjoyed it overall from start to finish i didn't keep checking my watch i was enthralled yes there's even dialogue dennis <laughs> denis Valouve. uh there there's cinematic there are visuals that are stunning i absolutely agree I feel yes. like this was a, a, a magnitude of capturing visuals with sound. Does that make for a magnificent movie? Not in my opinion, but it makes for a good movie. And I really did enjoy it and thoroughly uh, started to become invested in the lore, which the first one did not do for me. I was not invested in that lore. I did not care. I just wanted that movie to end. It was boring me senseless. Now I feel like, okay, we're heading somewhere. And I know some people, well, you know, you only had a first half of the book. doesn't matter to me. You had one movie. You got to you gotta sell it in that movie. Yeah, that's just how filmmaking works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you don't get to say, well, it'll, it'll make sense in the next movie. No, it needs to, it needs to make sense the first movie. It needs to be enjoyable the first movie. And it needs to, to really work the first film. There's a reason why so many people, and it's not just a few, so many people said that the first film was boring. Because nothing really moved. Uh, at any reasonable pace. It was just very sluggishly paced. This feels like a, a film that keeps going. It's heading toward a goal. It's setting up uh, the idea of fanaticism, the I, the idea of what it means to, to really play with the politics of war. Uh, really, what happens when everyone around you tells you you're amazing, but you don't believe it, but you you have to, or you think you should, but you know it might be the end of civilization if you do. I mean, there's a lot of factors that come into this, and I and I feel like those were complemented and and mostly realized, even if it's not this magnificent opus that so many wish it were. How did you feel when you walked out of it? Did you feel similar? <laughs> Sorry, I'll just we can put the soapbox away a second there. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I found myself 
puzzled when I was leaving the movie theater after watching this, because overall I sat there and I, and I, and I, I, I liked the visuals and I liked a lot of what I was seeing on screen, but I feel like at some point I should have been feeling like I was going to jump out of my seat and cheer for the, the, for, for Paul Atreides. I should have been able to like be afraid that something was going to happen to Paul Atreides. And and there were enough differences in this this movie versus what I've seen before in both the sci-fi series and in the original movie to know that okay, well they're they're diverting some things uh, here and there. So okay, um, but I I just didn't have that feeling. Did I? Can I say I had a good time watching a movie? Sure, I had a good time watching a movie. Do do I think it's amazing? No. Um I it's I feel like it's missing way too much uh of of the other things that I like that of the parts of the story that I do know and I, there's just it was just good. It wasn't an an amazing movie to me. And you watched did you watch the miniseries, the original movie? I did. Like you've watched all the dunes, right? Yeah, I watched the miniseries and the original movie. And the miniseries, I, I, the the original Dune movie was, it's boring to me. Even with all the cool stuff that's in there, it's boring to me. The miniseries I thought was beautifully done. It's got a Paul Atreides in there that you're like, yeah, let's go do this shit. Uh, it's got everything going on, uh, going for it. And it's, this is the same exact story that of uh, the first movie was only they take their time with it because they have six or seven hours to be able to do it with. Um, so. I was more invested into that story. And when they were, they announced that they were going to do these movies, I was hoping to see something on the level of that. But the casting started making me nervous right away because again, Timothy Chalamet is not somebody who I sit there and say, that's, that's a leader of men. Don't get me wrong. I love him as an actor. Wonka was fantastic. I think he has potential in different. I've just had a hard time with him in dramatic fair where I'm just, I feel like you're just longingly looking into the camera. And I know everybody in this movie either whispers or screams. That's literally all they do. (laughs) Right. There's no real genuine normal conversation like we're having. It's always like, you know, and and I I say this when I'm talking to Thomas too, but it's true. Hey, what's going to happen in silence? (laughs) Which is what I'm going to use from now on every time uh, John goes monologuing too long. I'm just going to shout at him like, Silence! And see if that works because apparently that's how you command a room. Whoosh. Right. Yeah. No. I. It's. I really wanted to enjoy it the way that so many fans are apparently enjoying it. Like so, there are many that are are saying that it's magnificent. It rivals Empire Strikes Back. It, this or that. You know, it's one of the greatest sci-fi epics of all time. Are people that are liking it that much though? Fans of the of the source material or the original series? I'm sure most of them are. I'm sure. Because uh, I feel like the people that are saying it's 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 the, the the first one I'm talking about because I haven't seen the second one yet. Mm-hmm. But the people that complained about the pacing of the first one have never read the book, or you know have no it's idea true. what's going on. Because yeah. I I feel like the first movie was not a good um, introduction to this universe for someone that has no idea. You know what I mean? Does the does the second one? bring you in better than the first one does yeah i know it's a weird thing to say about a sequel no i mean it really does yeah the, it's definitely the second chapter of a book right like it's the second half of the book it, it's really filling in a lot of what the setup was in the first movie and uh, don't get me wrong i mean i i get it like it's building to this this huge element i i just feel like it could have been done a little faster in the first movie and then this could have been fleshed out a little bit more in this one. I don't know. But it, it yeah, it, it definitely um and I understood everything that happened. I didn't think the first movie was complicated. Like I had no problem following the lore. I thought it was pretty simplistic, honestly. Yeah. It was it, it, so many people have said, Well, you just didn't just because you didn't understand it doesn't mean I'm like it had nothing to do with not understanding it, man. It wasn't that complicated. Like I got it. Yeah. <laughs> it just was not moving at a at a relatively f- interesting pace. It What's was to boring. understand? Yeah. It was a slog. <laughs> yeah. So this one, I, I really though I, I enjoyed Scott, and there's a few battle scenes in here that are pretty pretty top notch. Yeah, I don't think there's anything amazing. I do have some issues with editing. I feel like they jump around a little too quick in terms of what's going on. You know, long yep. periods of time happen in a cut, and I think that's not really doing non-readers a 
a good service. Like it's right. really not helping them understand like, why are we here? Where, how do we get from here to here? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to go spend six months in, this, in, in the desert by yourself. The next thing we know, it's, he's, he's running around killing people. Thank you. I, I literally, <laughs> you're about to hear the same conversation I had with Thomas about that exact segue. Like, it's basically, we're supposed to be spending six months in the desert and we just go to, he's back and apparently he's already done his time. <laughs> so right. it's a, there's, there's weird segues and transitions like that, that really don't flow. And I think it really affects the, the overall greatness of the film. But I still think it's a good film. So if tonight it's full price for mission, what do you give it, John? We're going to get into the spoiler spoiler re section here now. I give it six bucks. Okay. Well, I gave it six fifty. Uh, just so you know, if you, if you're wanting to put that out there on the internet, don't hide your scores. Only give it a ten because your life will be easier <laughs> and less complicated. No, I, I have come for me. They can't find me. <laughs> I have one more very important question for both of you. Okay. Um, if ten dollars were the full price of insertion, what do you? Uh, what would you pay for the popcorn bucket? <laughs> <laughs> and with that we're moving on all right that so, was well executed that was well, very well well done well done Perfect. aaron will tell you that he's so tired of that joke but very well executed <laughs> <laughs> oh my god all right thanks uh for that we're gonna go with, this is gonna be a spoilery section with thomas Bex, uh again longtime supporter in front of the show and he's going to kind of go into the the books a bit and what that all means and the differences there and we talk about that and why he loves this film so much and i don't understand the love and he's trying to help me understand it so i think it's a really interesting conversation so here you go here's thomas bex and i talking spoilery about dune part two and as we move into this i i just want to say you know this is very spoilery uh thomas and i talk about a lot of the the information that's in the book and not in the movie and vice versa and uh, one one point that I think is is kind of important, and that we didn't really get into while we were having the conversation, is the the part that Anya Taylor Joy plays plays as um, Aaliyah Atreides. Now in the book, she's very much alive. Uh, she did because a lot of the the time jumps uh, are not really represented fairly. So she's kind of an older child and ends up uh, she's the one. Spoiler alert that kills the Baron in the books. Now, it's obviously changed to Paul here. It gives Paul a lot more agency, and she's not even born yet in the movie, so I don't know what that means for the future, but apparently his sister has a lot of cool power, so that could be a character that is utilized in some other way in the future. We didn't really talk about that particular aspect, and I just thought I should mention it before we get into all of this uh, discussion of Doom Part 2 and what's in the book and what's in the film. So there's that kind of interested to see where, where they go and where they take that. And in order to really bring Anya Taylor joy into the, the fold, they really have to do a massive time jump. I don't even know if that's, that's feasible with the cast that they have because they would have to age them all up. Right. And I don't think that sounds very interesting for most people. So let's get into it. The Thomas Bex. Let's take it from here. I'm here with Thomas Bex. Longtime supporter of of the show and and listener and my god Dune fan. So you uh, before we get into it, you also have a podcast of your own. Do you you want to pimp that real quick before we move into this? Oh yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm I'm a co-host of the Adventure Game podcast. So if you're into gaming, into narrative games like point and click adventures, or um, just you know adventure gaming in 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 general, we um, we are the place to be. Uh, adventure games are not dead. They are very much alive, and they are a lot of fun to play nowadays. So uh, check us out on every, every anywhere where you can, where you're listening to your podcast. There you go. I want to get into Dune. Now, by this point, uh, John and I are going to review the movie separately. We're just going mm-hmm. to go over our, th- our thought, overall thoughts on the film. Um, you and I have talked about it. You love this film. I like this film. I did not like the first film, and you also love that film. Now, I, I kind of yes. want to know, do you think it's because you read the book, so there are books, actually there's a series of books, you read the books by Frank Herbert, right? I got that right? Yeah. Oh, see, look, I'm, I'm already I'm already learning. Uh, do you think, what, what's the difference? Like, why is this hitting so many people differently, I guess? Because some people claim this movie in particular is a masterpiece. I'm saying it's just good. and And I haven't seen much in the middle of that. 
Yeah, that's a very good question because everybody except you guys uh, that I've talked to uh, consider these movies like masterpieces, so including haters. myself. You're saying we're haters. Is that what you're saying? That's mm, what I'm getting. No, no, no. The movies are just not for you. <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> but uh, no, there is just um, – I'm not entirely sure if having read the book uh, because the two movies are um, – they, they, they are the, the first book and the probable third movie will be – probably the second book, Doom Messiah. Um, I am not entirely sure if having read those will um, has, has enhanced my enjoyment of the movie besides, um, you know, having seeing what I have read a long time ago on screen realized as I have never seen it realized before. I mean, you have to, whatever you think of the movie itself, it is stunning to look at. So uh, Denis Villeneuve, uh, y- yeah, y- you tend to mention that he uh, is not a big fan of uh, of dialogue, uh, which is probably correct, but he is an extremely good visual filmmaker. And a lot of his uh, things, and I think that's why he is connecting with June so well, and maybe that is why you are not connecting as well with it, is because he lets a lot of things be said by the visuals or by um, – by not necessarily by dialogue. Um, I have no issue with that. Um, I was just with the first film and this film as well. I was just stunned for like three hours experiencing the movie. I saw the first, the first June, I think I saw four times in the cinema. I got it on Blu-ray. I, I, bear, um, I, I really want to, uh, you know, experience it more. That's one of those movies that I really want to have. I want to own. Um, because I think it's so incredibly well done, and it is. It really, um, it gave me the same feeling as I had when I first saw the Fellowship of the Ring. Like this is something I read that I had something mm. in my head, even though it was like adapted not entirely well before. Like with the June nineteen eighty four version, sure. uh, the Fellowship. The Fellowship also had like a, a version, the, the Ralph Baxi uh, version before that, and uh, but this was just so incredibly well done uh, the way only a movie can can do it you know the combination with the visuals with the story with Hans Simmer's music uh, yeah it was just it just hit me um, really really deep now do you feel okay so when you when you come to Paul At- Atreides right Timothy Chalamet uh-huh. or Timothy Chalamet is actually how you say it but everybody calls him Timothy uh <laughs> When he's carrying this role, you know, he's supposed to lead them to paradise. He re- he does not want anything to do with this uh, for most of the movie. And then at the very, very end of the film, he makes a flip and he basically embraces it so he can conquer the empire es- essentially and, you know, take over as emperor. That's like his whole main goal there at the flip. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's his journey in this film. His journey is basic. basically he's going to, you know, I don't want to say betray um Shani, but he kind of does, right? And uh-huh. he's going to take the emperor's granddaughter for himself, and this is how he's going to ascend to the throne. Now, by the end, it feels very much, I, I think you could take it multiple ways, but to me, it reads, and you you tell me, without spoiling anything in the future, he's kind of embracing this role for his own benefit. It's not really that he believes he is the Messiah or this leader of, or the chosen one, so to speak of this prophecy. It's just, he finally embraced that. This is the only way I'm going to achieve my revenge and also take back what was rightfully mine. Is that a fair assumption or am I reading it wrong? That is 100% correct. Yeah. Okay. I would, I would say, um, um, you can see already see glimpses of, uh, the man he is becoming. Um, there are, this is a slight deviation from the book because, um, if, well, well can I talk what happens in the book with this? Sure. Or, yeah. Uh, this is spoiler cast. Yeah. We're, we're open. You can do what you want. Oh, okay. Uh, so in the book, um, the marriage to, um, I would go, uh, the, I would the, go carefully with anything we haven't seen though. So I would just be careful with that. It's oh like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, hey, I'm sticking yeah. to, uh, to, to, to the first book, which is these two movies. Okay. So in, in the book, the marriage to the, the, the emperor's daughter is Purely a political thing, which makes it is one hundred percent a political thing, and Chani knows that. But the character of Chani has been changed a wee bit. She's been giving way more agency in the movie. Uh, obviously, if you cast someone like Zendaya, you you re- and and in if you do it 
in the times that we live in, you have to do that. And um, she's also been giving more like um, um, a counterweight to uh, yeah to Paul Atreides, who quite yeah as I as I've heard somewhere, I think it was a Ringer guy saying he literally drinks the cool the Kool Aid mm-hmm. of of the myth, but he knows this myth, this legend, this this prophecy has been fabricated by the Bene Gesserit. He knows that Chani knows that, um, so. He kind of is like exactly what you said. He 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 breaks uh, in, in the movie. He breaks Johnny's heart, right? And he he chases her off. But he kind of knows this has to happen for him to um, yeah to to get on the the the, the path, or or he thinks that has to happen for him to get on the path that he wants to be on. And in the book, she still stays as his concubine, as his real love, uh, while he is married to the. To the princess, uh, um, whose name escaped me at the moment. Sorry, I've been very bad with names. Irulan. Princess or, Irulan. Uh, yep, Irulan. Yeah, Irulan. Yep. Yeah. So um, that is a change. I actually I kind of like because it 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 allows for more conflict, and conflict obviously is interesting in the uh, in in movies and stories. And I I guess we'll see how that will play out in uh, in a in a third movie because I think they already started production on June three. Um, so that is, yeah, it is what is, it is exactly what you said. I'd, I'd almost say that this is not a hero's journey, but a villain's journey. Interesting. That, um, uh, Paul Atreides is on because it is quite simple. Frank Herbert never intended, he, he, he wanted to highlight the very real dangers of following a charismatic leader of believing in prophecies. And because what Chani says is, is true that prophecy has been keeping them chain uh, a chain to that you know yeah, they've that's been how waiting. they enslave us right that's what she says exactly they, they've yeah. been waiting for this outsider to come and freedom either even though they should be freeing themselves which is what paul also says in the beginning when he is still on the on 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 the path where he said well no the, the fremen need to be uh um Led by one of their own, freed, kind of yeah, freed by one of their own, led by one of their own, and he changes uh, that once he has drank uh, from the um, from the blue liquid, the the the, the mind altering thing, mm-hmm. basically like the the, the spice uh, thing from the baby worm, and he starts believing in his own myth, using it to enact his revenge, as you were saying, even though he knows when he does that, terrible things are going to happen. Yes, because he talks about them throughout the movie, like throughout the entire exactly. film. He's talking about this. This is what's going to happen. I've seen it like with my own eyes. I know this will happen. And you can tell at the end he doesn't care anymore. Like he just wants his ultimate revenge. And that, you know, exactly whether he ends up being a villain. I mean, I guess time will tell. But this is kind of uh, the the beginning of an ascension. And it kind of shows like what happens when even a, a good man gets too much power or buys into their own their own mythos, you know. It's the danger power of power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, and he is now a very very powerful person, mm-hmm. um, and he's leading an, uh, an, a holy war, and basically he is just doing the exact same thing as what every other uh, ruler of Arrakis has done, except now he uh, he's using the Fremen to uh, accomplish his own goals. Yeah, and they're and they're buying is, hook and hook and line yeah. and sinker. Yeah. Yeah, which is what happens when you have like these zealots, these uh, fundamentalists, uh, that and we, we've seen that this in our own religion, in our own history, and in, in the in the Earth religions as well. When the fundamentalists take over, uh, it's very hard to uh, to stop that. Um, which also makes it uh, very uh, eerily uh, prescient and uh, in, in what's currently happening in parts of the world. So, yeah, I found that actually kind of, kind of fascinating that they didn't pull it back at all because it is there's a lot of religious zealot uh discussion interaction just how blind followers can be how how you know and i think i think it was chani at one point that says you know if you if you believe that there's a chosen one you sit and wait as opposed to doing exactly. something and that's yes. that's the danger of it you wait for that chosen one and you just someone's going to come and claim that throne at some point whether they are or they aren't because everybody wants that job yeah, even though you know the whole chosen one is a story fabricated by the Bene Gesserit for centuries mm-hmm. to uh, make sure their 
the, one of those bloodlines can be the Kwisatz Haderach, which is their own idea of this chosen one uh, person, which now looks to be uh, uh, Paul Atreides. Um, but yeah, it's it's um, the story is quite dense. The story is, of, is also written in the, in the 1960s, which had a completely different political climate on 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 Earth as well, of course, and uh, the the. The comparison to uh, to uh, uh, Arabia in the, the Arabic tribes and everything that is one hundred percent on purpose. Uh, also in the in the names and everything that is that that sounds also very uh, Islamic, very uh, uh, Arabian, and that is that is on purpose because he took a lot of a lot of the things from uh, from there from that culture as well. Um, because the Fremen are basically like Bedouins, and if you look at how they were um, uh, how they were used during World War II, for instance, and World War One, they were also like um, Lawrence of Arabia. So basically, um, Paul Atreides is some sort of Lawrence of Arabia on a universal scale. Going back to Paul Atreides, some of what happens with him, I don't think the film does a very good job of explaining. Maybe you can. You can enlighten me, right? Me non-book uh-huh. reader. It's kind of like when Game of Thrones is out. It's like, what happened in the book again? What happened? <laughs> so, at, you know, and I know this happens in both films, right? It happened in the 84 version when he's fighting uh-huh. Sting, which is kind of goofy yeah. if you go back and rewatch that one. Um, and it also happens here. But when he drops the silence and it's almost some kind of metaphysical reaction, like he he commands some kind of power in that moment. Can you yes. explain that? to me because i don't think the film did a very good job of explaining that no, i think they did that on purpose um that voice that command that is that is you could compare it to like a, a magical spell that commands people you see uh jessica uh use it um, yes, saw, several times as well sure you saw her use it yes that is that is a bene Gesserit, uh ability they can um influence people. She uses it on Chani to make sure that Chani um, uh, plays her part in the whole prophecy because Chani doesn't want to. She uh, she doesn't want to do that, but she for- she Jessica forces her to do that. That is not so- that is the sign that Paul is the Kuzach Hadarak because he's not supposed to be able to do that. To use that uh, that power. Uh-huh. Now in the book in the book and also in the 1984 version, they actually uh, weaponize that power. Um, I think that was quite hard to. Uh, for, for some reason, uh, Villeneuve decided not to use that in this book or in this in in this trilogy. Maybe in the future, but in the in the eighty four movie and in the yeah, books, he cracked the ground actually, in the in the movie. Yes, they they use that power. They they somehow magnify that that that. Um, so Paul teaches the Fremen how to use that power. So he teaches it to other people, and then they somehow use technology to. Um, yeah, to magnify that, and which basic, basically makes them unstoppable. You, you know, uh, being on giant worms also kind of makes them unstoppable. But then it, it really makes them unstoppable. That's how. That's how they uh, win the the holy war that starts at the end of the movie. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's that's a very dangerous uh, dangerous power that he uses, and again. Um, power corrupts, and even uh, good intentions uh, will not be able to save him in 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 this case if he goes along that path. And um, yeah, we'll have to see how the how he goes. Well, you've uh, read in, the, books. the third movie. You already know how he's where he's going. Uh, so Rebecca <laughs> Ferguson's Jessica, or Reverend Mother, as we I guess we call her now. Like, yeah, she she's really using the zealots for her benefit. She's clear, oh, she's she's clearly manipulating them. And so yeah. she, I would say, is at this point a villain. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, I mean, I get why she's doing it. She's doing it because she ultimately wants to protect her son and her new uh, unborn baby and whatnot. But it feels very much like she's going to use all of those people just to do whatever she needs to do. Exactly. Yeah, she she basically does the what the Bene Gesserit has been doing for ages, except now she uh, focuses on her son. And um, once she becomes the Reverend Mother, and those uh, powers are awakened in her, and those memories are awakened in her, she 
kind of embraces her Harkonnen side mm-hmm. and uh, uses that manip- – yeah, manipulates, uh, uh, quote-unquote, weaker people – to to do her bidding um and that's yeah she can be uh she's frightening she's quite scary she's she's definitely not the same caring loving mother that you see in the first movie no um and, I, and I'm, glad is, to, I'm glad to see that because uh rebecca ferguson is great at that i mean rose the hat if you ever saw dr sleep she's just phenomenal and evil <laughs> roles anything yeah, that goes a little a, bit darker she, you know she's a great actress she, she, can, she can do so much and um uh, I I love the way the, the what they did with the look of the uh, of the Bene Gesserit in general, but especially her with the well, I guess it's tattoos on her face and mm-hmm. all that kind of makes her really really intimidating. Uh, even if she was still a good guy, <laughs> she's not totally evil, but she is. She's yeah, she is uh, doing her own thing. Um, yeah, making in, in trying to protect Paul, but. Maybe she unleashed something that they can't quite control anymore. What What did you think about this Harkonnen family? You know, you've got Baron Harkonnen, who is he's still in Skarsgård in the, the most gross fat suit he could find. Uh, he <laughs> looks a lot like that guy from Blade, if you remember him. And then you've uh-huh. got um, uh, Austin Butler as Fade Rotha, and then Dave Bautista as Beast Raban, who I... I got to say, I love that he basically plays a bitch in this movie. He's an absolute whiny bitch. Like, he just turned into a total coward and pansy. I like that turn. I thought that was great. Yeah. What would you think of this family and how they play, how they delivered them based on what the book had? Well, um, in the books and in the 84 movie, uh, they really um, focus way more on how disgusting they are. Mm-hmm. Not, how much, not necessarily how evil they are, but how disgusting they look. And how they, they're basically the, the embodiment of the, like the, the, the seven sins, you know, gluttony and, and greed and everything. Um, he gives it, uh, in this, in these movies, I like, kind of like it better because they make him more evil, more sinister. Um, they still look very, uh, very striking. And also that we see the Harkonnen homeworld with a black sun. And apparently that's why, uh, everything is in black and white, uh, when it comes to Harkonnen. It's also their way of thinking is also quite black and white. You're either with them or against them. And if you're not strong enough, you die. So there's constant mm-hmm. intrigue, uh, constant backstabbing going on. Um, and eventually that, um, well, that gets the Baron killed, which is not a, Big loss, of course, but yeah, I I I kind of like how they portrayed them. Um, I, I I do like what you said as well that uh, Rabban was a bit uh, was not, but on the other hand, yeah, now I, I he, yeah, and I, I, I the fight between him and um, Gurney Halleck, I kind of liked that it was over so quickly. A, a lot of people were complaining about that, but I kind of loved it. Like Gurney was. Just okay. I'm gonna finish this, and it was like three st- three strikes, and it was done. Yeah, I really dug. I really dug that. I was I was like, yeah, yeah. This is probably how it would how it would happen. Yeah, I, I could see that though. I, I'm sure a lot of people wanted to see a big drawn out action scene, and um, those two kind of felt like they had one coming, and then it's very very short sighted. Yeah, definitely. Because in the first movie, Raban is the one who uh, slaughters all the uh, yeah, he's who, the, who leads the Yeah, he leads the attack on the Atreides. And Gurney has been uh, uh, wanting to get his revenge on that for uh, – and he wasn't going to draw it out. He was just going to – like, I'm going to kill this this asshole and I'm going to do it quick. And Gurney, as we saw also in the first movie, is a brilliant f- fighter. So uh, it makes sense that he would do it like this. Plus, we also uh, – from a technical point of view, we also had the uh, – uh, we're going to get the big fight between Feyrauta and uh, Paul Atreides, which was way more important to the story. And if you had another big fight before that, that and in an already long film, it probably would have looked cool. But I think uh, I agree with the choice to speed it up a bit more by making that very quick. I, I just really – that's probably one of my favorite aspects of the, of the film is how they neutered <laughs> Beast Robin um, throughout the film. Because in the last film, he's just this big badass who just tears everything down, right? In the first film, that's what he does. He just massacres everybody. And he starts that way in this one, but slowly because he's getting just his ass handed to him over and over and over again, you see his, yeah. his fear, you know, fear is the mind killer, right? So it starts mm-hmm. breaking his mind apart and he becomes weaker and weaker. And then he just, I think that's a big factor why that fight was so short is because he had almost given up at that point. Like he was done. He Absolutely. just, yeah. 
Yeah. The more he, he, he was getting so, of, he was becoming so scared of making mistakes that he was making mistake after mistake after mistake. So, uh, yeah, fear, fear was the mind killer indeed. Very, uh, very well put. Now, one yeah. thing I have an issue with the movie. So you say masterpiece. Here's where I have, I'm just going to give you one example of an issue I have, right? Mm-hmm. I think some of the editing and the scene setups are, are kind of almost piss poor. Because you, you go from Paul is out there proving himself in the desert, right? He's going to go out. And then, of course, Johnny goes out to help him. Fine. But then it just segues and moves on to an attack on a, a spice harvester with barely any explanation. It just segues to that. And we almost, like, don't get to know. So he completed it then? Like, I assume they accepted him. I mean, I just feel like there's no real closure to certain moments. It just kind of moves to the next thing. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I can I can see that. Yeah, uh, but it didn't bother me. Um, it was kind of bit bit of man, maybe expected. Like, okay, they're training. Yeah, in this case, maybe uh, having read the book kind of helps there. Fills in the blanks. Uh, yeah, um, maybe a bit subconsciously because, as I said, I read the book like 30 years ago. But uh, I am going to reread it before uh, um, any uh, third part is coming out. But yeah, I, I guess it it does fill in some of those blanks where um, it's maybe not that important to to know that he finished it. I mean, the fact that he is on that raid with them and holds his own kind of implies that. I, it didn't bother me, um, but I can see that uh, it might bother some people. How do you how do you feel about the new uh, Fade Ratha? You've got Austin Butler out here, and and I feel um, I like Sting. <laughs> I did. I like I like Sting for whatever. I don't know why. I just thought he was just what a wild casting choice to have yeah. Sting. And now yeah. you've got Austin Butler, and I feel like he. At first, I felt like all he was doing was just staring at the camera, doing that whole "I'm bad, I'm evil, I'm bad." Look how look how hard look how dark I can look at the camera. Look how evil I look. And then then he started putting his movements into it. And I'm like, okay, now I'm I'm starting to come along and buy into this guy. What did you think about his performance? I'm just kind of curious because he's a really big character in the book. And, yeah. you know, this is a huge fight. Do you feel like they delivered in that respect? Yeah. Um, I think they uh, they did show how why he was so feared. Um, because he was he is brutal, but he is also honorable in a way. Like, he really does want things to, to go a certain way. He's like, uh, in, in D&D terms, he probably would be lawful evil. Mm-hmm. The fact that his brother, who is supposed to be this big badass, cowers before him at one point, also shows him that he's the bigger bad at that point. And the fight between um, between him and, and Paul also shows that Paul is not invulnerable. Like, he almost dies in that uh, in that fight. It's not like he won that easily. And I think that is also important to know that uh, to, to remind that this prophecy is a made up story and uh, he can still be killed. He's not, he's still immortal. So, yeah, it's, uh, I, I thought that was, that was pretty well done. I, lo- I love the aesthetic. I love the look, the bold, the boldness with the black teeth and everything that that aesthetic really thought was really cool. And he fought like a, like a madman, so uh, I, I, I thought it was also pretty cool, and it it allows them also to ex, uh, to show more of the Bene Gesserit manipulations going on behind the scenes, you know, with uh, one of the uh, one of the Bene Gesserits getting pregnant with him, so they could pre- uh, preserve the bloodline and all that that stuff that was going on there. That was also important to to link that because they really are like m- much more manipulative, like they they plan their schemes uh, centuries ahead. So uh, I thought that that really fit in well there. So I, I really liked that. I I like, I like came to like his character. I was not, a, like at first, I'm just, just stop staring at the camera, dude. I feel like you're just doing a TikTok video right now. But eventually he came, <laughs> he came around and I'm like, all right, all right, I'm buying into him. And yeah. by the end, I was really kind of bummed because I knew once that fight happened, just because I, I didn't read the book, but I saw the 1984 David Lynch version. So I remember, oh, Sting died, you know, so I knew that was coming, but I was very, very sad because yeah. I was starting to like that character a little bit, you know, just to, just to have somebody maniacal. I got to say though, and, and here's where we probably really deviate a lot from each other. 
I don't, I don't think he's bad. Please, please don't take this. Uh, you know, I feel like with this movie, uh, if you don't say it's absolute praise, you're a hater, which is insane to me, but whatever. <laughs> but Timothée Chalamet, I don't think is the best casting for this. I just, I just don't because there are very important parts of the movie where you need to understand why this whole world is following him. And you also need to believe that he's a badass. And I have a hard time with both of those. Now he's not bad. He does good enough for me to stay in the movie and say, you know, and embrace it and go forward with it. I just don't, you know, if this would have been somebody like a Robert Pattinson or uh, something along those lines, I feel like I would have bought it a lot more, you know, maybe younger Robert Pattinson, but because, you know, he's supposed to be a younger character. I just don't know if Chalamet is, is the, the right guy. I mean, he's good, but some people are acting like this is an Oscar caliber performance. And I don't see it. Um, I wouldn't go that far, but I did. I did like him in the role. Um, he has a he has the right looks. Um, he's a he is a good actor. Um, if uh, like uh, Rebecca Ferguson was a standout, I think in the first movie, uh, um, in this one it was mo- um, crap. Uh, as I said, I'm I'm bad with names nowadays. Stilgar. Um, oh, Javier Bardem. Yeah, yeah. I thought he was a standout in this movie. Um, being both uh, bringing some levity and also bringing some um, uh, some heavy uh, heavy themes into it as the the true believer, mm-hmm. and Zendaya, I, I really thought Zendaya was fantastic. She's very quiet, yeah. very reserved, very contemplative. But I think that really served the film. There was there was a lot happening with body language in the movie, sure. uh, which I I kind of like. Um, so that's. Uh, that's probably because uh, Villeneuve doesn't like dialogue, so... <laughs> he doesn't. And it, this is one... Th- okay, this is my other big critique about the movie. When it comes to dialogue, when it comes to actual performances... Now, visually, everything is pretty stunning. I, I have no qualms about that. The guy can shoot a beautiful film. It's always going to look... I don't think his editing is quite great because he can tighten this shit up. Scorsese, you know what I'm saying? Like, just bring this together a little <laughs> tighter. But why does every character... Every, Almost every character either whispers or screams, and there's not much in between. There's no just genuine general talking like we're doing. It's all, hey, you're the chosen one, or silence. You know, it's one of those two. Well, you don't want to wake the worm, right? <laughs> so you got to be whispering. <laughs> I guess it's a, you know what? That's probably the best explanation right there. That's the worms. <laughs> They're afraid of the worms. I get it. I mean, have you seen the worms? They look bloody amazing i wouldn't want to be eaten by them <laughs> yeah i i will i will say that the worm riding scene where he he goes out and he has to prove himself by, by catching the biggest worm they've ever seen that was a pretty fantastic pretty fantastically realized scene i have to say yeah but that had to be that was the one of the key scenes and that's one of the key scenes in the whole book as well you know that has to be he had to nail that uh and he did he did. I love um, again a bit of uh, that. That that was one thing that always stuck with me with the book, where they actually explain how they can write the worm because it doesn't really get explained. But you see it; it doesn't get explained in words. But you see it happening where he lifts up the 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 worm's skin. It's all like all these uh, these parts of the skin that cover each other, which makes sure that uh, sand doesn't get in. Uh, get under his skin because it's it might be a sandworm, but he doesn't want to get sand inside his body. So um, with the way they write the worms, they lift up that uh, that piece of scale uh, and um, yeah, um, uh, his inside becomes uh, open to the outside, and so um, sand could get in. So that's why he doesn't uh, why the worm doesn't dive in, and they can write the worm. So I thought that was uh, that was pretty uh, pretty well done, um, and everything they uh, they consume um, becomes spice. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's quite. Uh, I, I thought the worms were quite stunning. N- not the worm uh, popcorn bucket though. That one was a bit uh, scary. Oh man, I, I'm about tired of those TikTok jokes. Everybody's making a joke about the popcorn bucket. I'm like, look, you know what? Just if it's consensual, I have no problem with it. <laughs> You know? We don't get those here in Europe, so we don't get those uh, popcorn buckets. I think you're going to be okay without it. I really, I really do. I think you're going to be just fine. It just feels like I know, it's I know. Dangerous. But the 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 Ghostbusters one uh, for the new Ghostbusters movie, that one looks really, really cool. I would love to have one of those, but yeah, unfortunately, we only get the normal uh, cardboard buck, uh, buckets here. So <laughs> if it makes you feel any better, I never go anywhere near them, so I never see them. I'm just like, hey, I do not want to be tempted to spend thirty bucks 
on a, on a popcorn bucket. It doesn't even come with free refills. Like I can't even just bring it back and get free <laughs> refills every time. Come on. Does it does it at least come with some butter? <laughs> I, you know, I'm I'm sure you can get as much butter as you want, and you know, go get a <laughs> private room or something. <laughs> <laughs> that was not what I meant, but I get uh, I get it. <laughs> uh, uh, the only other thing I would say, I, I thought uh, Florence Pugh was wonderful as always. I wish she would have had more to do in this movie. I have to assume yes. she'll have more in the future. Like she, well, the Emperor to too. Yeah, you know, I, yeah. You sometimes Walken. forget. You sometimes forget how great an actor Christopher Walken is. But I wish that were a bit. That that was my one gripe is I would I would have loved to see a bit more from them. Um. In, in the movie. But, you know, the movie's already long enough, so. Now, did you see it twice? I know you were talking about going to see it again. Did you end up seeing it again? Uh, not yet, but I'm going to try and see it in IMAX, but I can only see that in a different city, so I have to plan that. Oh, you, you're you actually going to leave town to go see this in IMAX. That's how much you love yes. it. Yes. Yes. Okay. I need to experience this on IMAX. All right. Anything you want to say in, in closing on this before we wrap it up? Um, no, I, I just, uh, this, this movie feels like it was made for me. So, um, and, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that, uh, that we're getting this. And I'm also hoping, uh, that we get a confirmation of a third one. And if it's, uh, if that one is just as good as the, as the previous two, then, uh, for me, this will be one, uh, uh one trilogy that is almost on par with, uh, Lord of the Rings. So. Now there's multiple books. I know Messiah is the next one. Can that be the end then? Or is there, do you need to go after that? No, I think they could end it after Messiah. I have to say the the books become quite weird because there is these, there are these big ideas and he really, really works out those ideas till the, till their logical end. And I, what, from what I remember when I read them, I, as I said, I was, I was quite young. I think I was a teenager when I read them. Mm-hmm. They were so really, really, really weird. Um, but I think maybe I wasn't old enough yet to fully grasp all the ideas that were in there. So that's also one of the reasons I want to uh, reread them. But I do I do think that books one, two, and maybe three, uh, they could add them. But especially books one and two, they could make a very solid uh, trilogy. Well, I got a feeling based on the box office, you're going to get your third movie for sure. Now, do you feel... Like some of some of the hype, this rivals the Dark Knight, the Empire Strikes Back, films like that. This is one of the top sci-fi films that you can think of. For me, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It would. It for me, it's up there. Okay, it's got to be because I don't. I didn't read the book then. I, I don't. I don't know. I, I just. I. I like it. I just didn't love it. Oh, that's that's perfectly fine. <laughs> not according I mean, to the internet. It's not according to the internet. If oh, you hater, you don't like anything. You're just trying to be cool. <laughs> Like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe if this was the first review I've heard from you, then I could have uh, could have uh, imagined that. But uh, no, I I know you. Uh, people can make up their own mind, and if this movie was not connecting with you as much as it's connecting with other people, then well, that's that's too bad. But yeah, I mean, at least you liked it. it wasn't a waste of time. Yeah, and I didn't hate the first one. I gave it like a four and a half. I didn't. I didn't like. I didn't like it a lot. But I saw so much <laughs> potential. This one I like. This one I would rewatch. You know. I, w- I would actually watch this one again, and I wasn't bored laying, you know, just laying in my seat waiting for this thing to end, which I was in the first one. The first one was a half an hour long or a half hour shorter, and I was looking at my watch all the time. I wasn't, I wasn't bored at all with the first movie, but yeah. See, that's, that's me. That's the difference. <laughs> Maybe I'll go back and yeah. rewatch it and see if I can, you know, see what I was missing. Maybe I was wrong. It happens. Yeah. Well. You know, there's so much, so many things to watch and 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 experience. Uh, but this one uh, is is I've been looking forward to it since. Well, yeah, basically since the first one came out, it it did not disappoint me at all. So it, it's it, it as I said before, it's giving me the same, almost the same uh, feeling as I as I had when I was watching Lord of the Rings. All right. Well, I'm I'm pretty excited to see what comes next. Uh, I, I thankfully thank you for not spoiling it. I'm sure we're gonna have a holy war. We're gonna get more of uh, well, that's, this. That's pre- that was pretty obvious from the end of the yep, movie. Absolutely. <laughs> and also, there, there's a little bit of a setup that uh, Fade Ratha has a baby out there. So there's you know another mm-hmm. heir in in play. So there's that. You know, those Bene Gesserit are not happy with what's the things that are happening. So, uh, and they are very powerful players as well. So, yeah, there's there's still plenty of uh, of threats that can uh, 
that can be pulled on. So Excellent. Mm. Well, we'll see where it goes. Thanks again, Thomas, for coming by. I always appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. And remember, guys, next time you head to the theater to see Dune Part 2 and IMAX for the 14th time because it's the best thing you've ever seen in your entire life, buy popcorn. Too much? <laughs> <laughs> Too much butter, maybe. Jeez, <laughs> oh, those freaking buckets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.